Good afternoon. This is Transportation Committee Chair Deb Barber. It's Monday, May 24th, 2021. Before I call the meeting to order, I would like to say a few things about how we will conduct this meeting. I want to acknowledge that COVID-19 is causing us all to alter our usual procedures. As we know, Governor Walls has declared a peacetime emergency in response to COVID-19. Accordingly, Met Council members will participate in this meeting by phone or other electronic means, and this Transportation Committee meeting will be conducted under Minnesota Statutes Section 13D.021. Before we start the meeting, we need to establish whether there is a quorum. Uh, with that, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Here. Cummings. Here. Ferguson. Fredson, Gonzalez, Sterner, here, Zirin, and Barber. Here. Zirin's present. Uh, having a quorum present, I call to order the meeting of the Metropolitan Council Transportation Committee meeting for May 24th, 2021. Um, our first um, item of business is approval of the agenda. If uh, there are no changes or additions to the agenda. We can proceed to the approval of the minutes. All right, um, seeing none, then we'll move to the approval of minutes. Uh, it's for the minutes for the May 10th, 2021 meeting. Did anyone have any changes or additions? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. This is Sterner. I'd make a motion to approve the minutes. Moved by Sterner. Is there a second? Coming seconds. Seconded by Cummings. Um, any other discussion? Hearing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Fredson? Gonzalez? Sterner? Aye. Zirin? And Barber? Aye. Uh, I heard that um, Councilmember Zarin was an aye, and I'm also an aye. With that, the minutes are approved. Now, our next item is our tab report. We have Mr. Dugan here today. Yeah. Welcome. Yes, well, thank you. And good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and honorable committee members, General Manager Koistra, and Director Thompson. And before I get in the tab report, I want to thank Member Cummings for those wise words. Yeah, COVID has taught us a lot, and uh, we, yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow, you just don't know. And then it's good to take advantage of what we have today. Uh, Council Member Fredson has been participating in our unique projects work group. I, I know he's not here today, but it's great to have him. So far, the goals for the unique projects have been uh, acclimated as environmental impacts, racial equity, innovation and scalability or regional impact. In other words, how big can they get and make a, make a major impact? Ahead in the process of the next three to four meetings or finalizing goals in the process, what are the evaluation criteria going to be and how is that going to be in turn evaluated? From the MPCA, they are putting out uh, two uh, RFPs for grants. Uh, one is for school bus replacement, uh, diesel, propane and natural gas, I mean, that's, I'm sorry, that's the two grants, diesel, propane, and natural gas. And on May 7th, the administrative law judge approved their proposed clean car rules. From the MAC, uh, not terribly much, the, uh, the silver parking ramp at Terminal 1 won a grand uh, award for construction. Uh, and it's for, one was from a national business group. The other was from the uh, Finance and Commerce newspaper. Delta uh, received an award from JD Powers, the consumer survey uh, agency for the top domestic carrier and flights are beginning to pick back up to, you know, not approaching normal, but they are picking back up. Uh, we also, uh, as you see on your agenda, I believe the, uh, the TIP has, the transportation improvement plan has been uh, put out for public comment. And just as a quick review, that's a a four year list of transportation projects, every transportation project funded in whole or in part by federal funding funding and or affecting air quality. It's required of all MPOs and it is then incorporated into the statewide transportation improvement program, the STIP. A lot of, <laughs> and then continuing our conversation on equity at TAB, we were, uh, 
honored to have Ms. Uh, Ms. Tawana Black, the founder and CEO of the Center for Economic Inclusion. And her topic was transportation for inclusion and equitable economic growth. I'll, I'll go through just a, a couple of brief comments. Uh, and if you would like to uh, see her presentation, it is on the Metropolitan Council website for the TAB meeting of last week. That would be May the 19th. As many of you probably know, the Center for Economic Inclusion's mission is to <clears throat> is to close racial wealth gaps. And the other goal is shared accountability for inclusive and region, re, regionally inclusive economic growth. And in the, she divided her presentation, I believe, into um, five five well, basically four four and a half parts. I'll just say. The first was the case for economic inclusion. Uh, we lag over our peers, the city peers in growth, inclusion, prosperity, and racial inclusion. And our peers, just as an example, Denver, Pittsburgh, Portland, Dallas, Charlotte. Uh, the second, the center's approach is based on three, um, three uh, parts, access to opportunity, upward mobility and increased empowerment. And the solutions she highlighted, which was great, were in many were in the transportation and access category and the human capital. And she emphasized that Minnesota, particularly with uh, you know our aging population and folks, you know, young folks leaving after college, uh, we need to get everybody on board to be as competitive as possible. We need everybody. Her third uh, point was uh, a new uh, how do I, uh, assessment called the Racial Equity Dividends Assessment, which tries to formulate the impact of employers on the employer's organization, the households of their employees, and the economy in general. And for instance, uh, just as an example, some of the metrics are, uh, what is your primary mode of transportation to get to work? How long does it take? And they also had a kind of a unique heat map on race and ethnicity, which was populated by feedback from um, the folks that were interviewed. The fourth point was the opportunity. And she, uh, I think, uh, opened a lot of eyes with, with her identifying three types of systems, the structural relationships and connections and mental. And that's really interesting. I'll just review them quickly. The structural is the explicit change. The semi-explicit is re relationship and connections and power dynamics among individuals and groups. The third, the mental, is implicit, but that's where transformative change is. That's changing the hearts and minds. And her fourth and a half, if you will, the, uh, the goal of her organization and her talk today is racially inclusive a racially inclusive economy, and that is in uh, defined as a racially equitable environment, wealth, and growth and prosperity. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Peter. Are there any questions from council members? Mm -hmm. Councilmember Chambliss. Um, I just wanted to say to Mr. Dugan, thank you for um, sharing that presentation. I will probably go back and take a look and get more detail. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And I think the recording is, of TAB is probably still up if you want to listen to the whole presentation live as mm -hmm. well. So. All right, uh, additional questions or comments from council members? All right, thank you, Peter. Um, so now we're on to uh, other reports. We've got MTS Director Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. A few updates tonight. Uh, first of all, the Downtown Minneapolis Farmers Market is beginning again, and this year they will be closing Nicola Mall on Thursdays. This will have a, a really big impact on metro mobility trips that require, uh, and they're going to require some changes for how our customers uh, make their trips when they were, we made a lot of drop offs and pickups of trips on Nicola Mall. So we will be in, implementing a communication plan and working with our customers who need to get to that area to make sure they have a safe trip and that we can escort them properly to their location. Um, but that'll last through October. So a slight change to operations for Metro Mobility on that, just on Thursdays in downtown Minneapolis. 
Um, as I mentioned before, Metro Mobility and Transit Link had moved to shared ride services again on May 1st. But we're limiting at that point, since then to two persons per trip. Uh, along with changes from Metro Transit, we will be removing any capacity limits on Friday the 28th for Metro Mobility and Transit Link. So kind of returning to full service, uh, normal service there. We do not expect this change to be too much of a change in operations though, because we typically average just two passengers per trip uh, normally for these two services. Uh, the Regional Bicycle Transportation Network, RBTN, is going undergoing its first update in several years. Um, we've notified cities, counties, regional parks agencies that they have until this coming Friday to submit any changes or additions to the bicycle network in the region that have occurred since the council and TAB adopted that uh, regional bicycle network uh, several years ago. They've been uh, asked, there's been a lot of changes. They've been wanting to get the RBTN changes made. And so this is gonna be their opportunity to get updates to that map. And this is an important step for our local partners because once a trail or route is on the RBTN network, it becomes eligible for regional solicitation funding. And so there's a lot of demand for using that source for funding of these transportation network, transit and bicycle networks. Lastly, a COVID update. Our contractor workforce had one positive uh, COVID test in the past week, um, but that is the only one we've had for all of May. So the trend is uh, really good. Uh, and we've had, we have only that one person who tested positive out. Everybody's returned to the workforce that's tested positive. So a very good positive news there, even though we did have one positive test. And from a service perspective, we, have actually seen a really strong return of transit ridership to our transit link dial ride service. This service had really plateaued for the past several months at 50% of the COVID levels and had not been seen any increase. But in the past three weeks, ridership has jumped uh, from 50% up to 65 or almost 70% of pre COVID levels and now is tracking at the same trend line as Metro Mobility. So Positive news there that we're seeing ridership return to transit length. So it's, that service had been sort of an outlier in our in our suite of services. So it's good to see ridership coming back there. And Madam Chair, that concludes my remarks. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank Are there you. questions from council members? Council member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Thompson, I'm just curious with the uh, farmer's market on the Nicollet Mall, I can understand the desire to not have traffic and especially uh, motor coach traffic, bus traffic, things like that. But is that a unilateral decision that the city and the farmer's market gets to make? I mean, it also has a, a profound impact on, on our ridership for Metro Mobility. Do we have a voice in that or do we just have to figure out how to accept it and, and uh, pivot? Uh, here, council member, that's a great question. They've been, they've worked very closely with us. Um, they've also worked, I believe, with uh, Metro Transit on rerouting those routes. And um, they've been listening to us very well. And we've been working through the different issues about how we could escort. Um, and they just felt that from an operation and safety standpoint of what they wanted to do at the farmer's market, they did need to not allow Metro Mobility uh, during that time, but they they listened to us, and we I think we've worked out a good compromise with them, and they were really receptive to our concerns and issues, and wanted to find a solution so that customers could still uh, get make it to their service, maybe just in a little bit different way through downtown. So they I think they had good open ears, but in the end, this is the, the what seemed to work for everybody the best way. Thank you. Okay. Additional questions, comments? All right, thank you, Nick. Um, now we're on to uh, General Manager Quistra. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll also add to Nick's response to Council Member Cummings. Uh, they did also work with us in terms of rerouting around Nicollet Mall during uh, on Thursdays. Uh, we're trying to find that balance between serving our our customers best and also supporting efforts by by the downtown to return uh, activity in the downtown area which in, in the long run serves us as well so 
Uh, I think we've had some good conversations about how to do that, and uh, our our staff, uh, as as uh, Nick's staff, have felt that uh, the workarounds that we're doing are doable, and and kind of strikes that balance uh, that we're trying to achieve there. Uh, as usual, I'll start out with with COVID cases at Metro Transit. Metro Transit has had a now a total of 438 employees who've tested positive for COVID since the start of the pandemic. Since last transportation committee on May 10th, we've had 14 employees test positive for COVID. I might remind you that we do not require uh, uh, employees to be vaccinated and, uh, and not all of our employees have been vaccinated. So we've had 14 cases. Uh, we still have all the, all the social distancing protocols and mass protocols in place. We continue to monitor the cases by location. We did detect a cluster at Ruder Garage that affected four employees who were in close contact. Uh, we followed our protocols. We included contract tracing and we alerted employees who were deemed to be close contacts. Uh, we're not experiencing any operational issues due to employees having COVID or needing to be quarantined. But of course, uh, I think at, at this stage of, of the pandemic, having 14 employees test positive is, is disappointing. Uh, I did send an email uh, to council members last week that we are uh, at, that we will begin to end capacity limits on vehicles this Friday. Uh, this is a really turning a turning of the corner for us, and we're really excited about being able to promote transit use again. It's been a long, more than a year of discouraging people from using transit. That's not in our nature. It's been difficult for us to do. And this is just a really exciting time for us to see this corner being turned. And I know that our marketing people are anxious now to start working on growing ridership again. Uh, I also received a monthly report this morning that showed a 36% increase in ridership from April 2021 uh, as compared to April 2020. Uh, we're kind of in that stage now where we can compare ridership in months of uh, that in, in months, a year to year, uh, that that we're ex experiencing the pandemic. So uh, that's a nice. It's nice to see that that in April uh, 2021 we had 36 percent more ridership than we had in April 2020. It's still a slow go. Uh, we're still not seeing big jumps in ridership month to month, uh, but we're anxious to, uh, to start doing some promotions and doing some work that will. That will help encourage encourage a return back uh, to transit from those who left us during the pandemic. Uh, also, for the first time since the pandemic began, we are hiring bus operators as we prepare to restore more services. Our first class of new bus operators in more than a year started on May 17th. Uh, this for, this is this first class is six who uh, are. Uh, this first class of six are also the first operators to start with full time st with a full time status in recent memory. We usually start operators at a part time status, but our need is full time status because our current part time operators uh, uh, we do not have enough current part time operators interested in a full time status. Our hiring efforts will continue. Uh, new hires are eligible for a thousand dollar hiring bonus. Uh, current employees who make referrals can earn a six hundred dollar referral bonuses. Uh, all that said, uh, of that exciting news, I'll mention again that masks are still required on transit. The federal government has extended the mask mandate through September 13th. Uh, Metro Transit continues to make masks available to customers through our operators, supervisors, and transit police officers. Uh, we did have max compliance checks. I mentioned this in the email as well that showed over 90% compliance on buses and trains, and that's a great sign. Uh, daily vehicle disinfecting will also continue. Uh, with respect to the mobile vaccination units, I understand uh, the most recent numbers we have that almost 3,500 or around 3,500 people have been vaccinated through those units. Um, that includes both first and second vaccinations, uh, second shots. And I know that uh, uh, the, the, our last trip was a bus trip to Todd County. It was it was featured in the New York Times article on innovative ways that different organizations are getting the vaccine to people in need. Uh, this week, uh, we have 25 different clinics scheduled across the metro area. And then finally, I was going to give it provide an update on C line chargers, but I'm going to defer that to uh, 
Terry Desmond's overview of the master contract business item later in the agenda, and she'll be providing an update on the on the status of the sea line chargers and and some of the other uh, uh, grant requests that we've that we've made. So with that, I'll take questions, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from council members? All right, seeing none, thank, thank you, Wes. Um, now we're on to our consent agenda. So um, as long as there's nothing to be removed from consent, um, I'd entertain a motion to approve the items on consent. Motion to approve. Move by Chambliss, is there a second? Fredson second. Seconded by Fredson, is there any other discussion? All right, uh, seeing and hearing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Sterner? Sterner? Zirin? Zirin's an aye. And Barber? Aye. With that, the item on consent are approved. Next, we're on to our next first business item, which is business item 2021-129, a same week item. It's master contracts for electric bus service. And we have Carrie Desmond here to present. Thank you, Chair Barber. Um, Welcome. Next slide, please. As General Manager Koistra mentioned, I'll give a, a brief update before going into this business item um, of some of the activities since his update to the full council in March. So we continue to work on getting the Haywood garage electric bus chargers replaced, which needs to occur before um, we can restore electric buses to service on the sea line. We're planning to have staff travel to the factory in June to witness the acceptance testing and approve those for shipment. And then we'll work to um, get those installed and tested on site after that. So hopeful for a return to service later this summer for the Sea Line electric buses. Staff have also been busy working on a number of grant applications this spring. Um, Metro Transit submitted a application for the low and no emissions program, as well as requested congressionally directed spending from our federal delegation to help us implement 40 foot electric buses and chargers. Um, so we're hopeful on both of those applications. We're also continuing to work with Excel Energy and the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission on the proposal for rebates for transit buses um, for electric buses. That is currently open for comment and the PUC is seeking comment on whether they should approve the program. Um, and a letter of support was submitted, um, signed by Chair Zelli and General Manager Koistra earlier today for that as well. Next slide. So today's business item is to award four master contracts to help with um, future electric bus projects. The first one is for a consultant to assist with design services, and that would be for infrastructure, things like um, additional chargers at bus garages or on-route chargers um, or alternative fuels if those are pursued. We've also got a contract for construction support services. So once we transition a project from design into construction, acting as the council's representative during construction to help oversee the work. Um, we also have a contract for testing and commissioning. This consultant's really responsible for helping us ensure that equipment is performing as designed and recommended for acceptance and payment. And then the final contract is for program management services. This is the one that we envision starting work on right away and really helping us further develop uh, Metro Transit zero emission bus transition plan. So I'll go into a little more detail on that first scope as well. Um, and I'll add that each of these contracts does have a DBE goal assigned 
um, contracts A, B, and C have a 6% goal and contract D has a 7% goal. Next slide. So the first work order um, that we plan to get started on is to help us advance the zero emission bus transition plan. And what we're looking to achieve with this is help, help us as Metro Transit and the council define what are our guiding principles that are really gonna set the framework for how we transition the fleet. And how do we take those principles and form them into goals and milestones um, for different projects, looking at the short, medium, and long term. We're envisioning short term being through 2025, medium term being in the second half of this decade, and long term being beyond 2030. And then taking those sort of overarching principles and goals and and really transforming them into assessment criteria that help us evaluate our service, our vehicles, and our different operating facilities to help us develop a program of projects that we can implement. And how do we prioritize between different potential projects? And what are the different obstacles, risks, constraints that are gonna inform the work? Next slide. So the proposed action for today is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to award and execute four master contracts for electric bus services to support Metro Transit engineering and facilities. The first contract is for design for HDR engineering in the amount of 550,000. The second contract is for construction support also to HDR engineering for 400,000. The third contract is for testing and commissioning services to Stanley Consultants in the amount of 450,000. And the final contract is for program management services to AECOM in the amount of $700,000. With that, I will take any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from council members? Council member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can it can you re tell us again what the DBE percentages were? They sounded like they were pretty low. I'm wondering uh, how they got set and what the expectation is there. Certainly. So packages A, B, and C, which are design, construction, and testing and commissioning, each have a 6% goal. And um, package D has a 7% goal. And I will note that past efforts in this space have had no goals for DBE participation. This is really um, an area that there's not a ton of experience. And so this is a step towards trying to expand that exposure to the DBE community and add goals to the project. Um, and I know we have some representatives from the Office of Equal Opportunity on the phone as well, if there's anything you'd like to add to that. Thank you, that's helpful. Okay. All right, any additional questions or comments from council members? All right, uh, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-129 the same week. Motion to approve. Motion by Chambliss, is there a second? Coming seconds. Seconded by Cummings, is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Sterner? Zirin? Zirin's an aye. And Barber? Thank aye. You, Zirin. With that in motion, um, passes. Thank you very much, Carrie. I believe that was Councilmember Sterner saying aye, so if you can add that as well. Um, next, we're on to business item 2021-125. It yes. is um, expenditures for procurement of goods and services. And we have, I believe, Paul Colton here. Yes, thank you, Chair and Council Members. Um, this afternoon, I have the following proposed action item that the Metropolitan and Council authorized the regional administrator to execute purchase agreements with North Central Bus Sales for up to 107 replacement buses and 36 expansion buses 
in an amount not to exceed $12,259,000 and with Hoagland Bus for up to 74 replacement buses and 25 expansion buses in an amount not to exceed $8,722,500. This procurement of 181 replacement buses and 61 expansion buses aligns with the bus replacement schedule and capital improvement plan. And uh, just about every provider uh, that's not Metro Transit is getting a small bus as part of this procurement. And this will take care of our uh, 2020 and 2021 replacement year for small uh, bus vehicles. Uh, all of the vehicles uh, in this list have uh, exceeded their five-year useful life and 175,000 miles uh, at a minimum. And this procurement will utilize the state of Minnesota's small bus uh, procurement contract, which, al which allows the council to purchase from multiple vendors at a competitive price and meets all federal requirements. Funding for these vehicles will come from uh, 5307 federal formula funds and regional transit capital. And these projects have been approved in the current capital improvement plan. And with that, I would be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Are there questions from council members? Council member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there any secondary market for all of the vehicles that are being replaced? Or, I mean, even if it is a small amount of money, it is something we can uh, use to offset this expenditure? Or is there an option to donate or do something positive with the buses that are being replaced? I'm sure that there are many who would be able to use them, even though they've outlived their usefulness in this particular market. Madam Chair, Council Member Cummings. Um, that is a great question, and I am so glad you asked it because um, we do both of those things. Um, as the vehicles near their end of their useful life and our new vehicles are coming into service and the old vehicles are being decommissioned, um, we have a list of different agencies um, that have contacted us um, that have an interest in a few small vehicles at a time to help their programs, and we work with them to donate those vehicles to them um, and so they live on further into another public life um, the rest of the fleet is uh, auctioned off at competitive auction we have a contract with Fahey sales and associates they do a fantastic job for us in preparing the buses for auction and they are sold to uh, different folks from all over the united states and and internationally so we do find a home for those and pricing has gone up um, fairly consistently over the last two years while using Fahey sales. Um, and I'm anticipating, because of the pandemic, um, that sales will be strong whenever we sell off our retired fleet. Quick follow up. Yep. Go ahead. Um, do you have even any ballpark idea of what kind of revenue that might bring in? Or if not, uh, can you let us know? what it did after the sale? Chair and council member, um, I'd be glad to do that. On average, we've been receiving about $3,000 to $3,500 per bus. Um, that's with smaller sales. Um, um, but I think we will, I think we will do 2,000 to 3,500 or a little higher in the next auction based on the market information I'm receiving from Fahey. I'd be glad to come back with those sales results for you. I would appreciate that. Thank you. That would be great. Thank you. Um, are there additional questions from council members? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-125. Cummings moves approval. Moved by Cummings. Is there a second? Second by Darren. Seconded by Zarin. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss? Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Sterner? Aye. Zarin? Barber? Zarin's aye. Um, Zarin's an I and Barbara is an I. And I'd circle back um, 
Council Member Chambliss, I think you are having connection issues. Council Member Chambliss, are you there? All right, we're all right. We have um, the, we have enough to um, uh, uh, approve the motion. So um, thank you very much, Paul. Um, so you. now we have to just decide what goes on consent to the full council. Obviously, the item on consent does, but um, uh, item number one is the same week item, so that'll go to the full council on Wednesday. But um, the 2021-125 can go on consent. I think. Does anyone disagree? All right, so that's where we have it. So we are done with our business for the evening, but we do have two information items. The first one is Brooklyn Center Transit Center updates, and we have Alicia Vap here to present. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. So um, my name is Alicia Vap. I work for engineering and facilities, and I was the project manager for the uh, renovation at Brooklyn Center Transit Center. Next slide, please. So this uh, transit center is located in Brooklyn Center near the intersection of Bass Lake Road and Northway Drive. Next slide. So there were many reasons why Metro Transit pursued uh, renovation for this transit facility. So um, the exterior of the facility, the, the concrete and the plaza was starting to have some deterioration issues. We also had some accessibility issues with some jointing and different items in, in the concrete. Um, we also had um, each um, end of the plaza, the west end and the east end was kind of a large expanse of concrete that was um, not really too pedestrian friendly. Um, we also wanted to take a look at really right sizing the interior waiting space. Um, on each end of the building itself were two small waiting areas and then the middle of the facility was a larger waiting area. And then there were hallways that connected each of those waiting spaces. So we wanted to take a look and, and uh, really maximize um, some safety and then also address some uh, safety and security issues. Um, we also wanted to take advantage of um, having some interior space that we could ro reprogram for our bus operation staff and for also for our uh, Metro Transit Police Department staff. Um, and then enhancing that existing um, break room area for our bus operations staff. I have some interesting photos <laughs> to share of what it looked like previously. And then with the expansion of our arterial bus rapid transit uh, with C-Line in 2019 and then D-Line coming next year, it's a great opportunity and time to do this work. Next slide. So I have a series of photos of what the, uh, what the site looked like before construction started. So the photo on the left, uh, really highlight some of those accessibility issues and deterioration issues. So we had pretty large tool joints that um, were proving to be problematic for us. And then the photo on the right just showed kind of that large expansion of concrete on one of the ends of the plaza, pretty unforgiving um, in the winter and in the summer. Next slide. And then uh, these are the interior um, public uh, public use spaces. So the photo on the left is taken from the large interior space. And then you can see kind of to the left on that photo, the hallway that goes down into the one of the smaller public waiting spaces. And that's the photo on the upper right. And then the photo on the bottom is um, the public restroom. It was just really in need of um, a refresh. Next slide. So these are some photos, um, as I alluded to, the, um, the bus operator break area. Um, just really needed kind of a refresh and some TLC um, just had some deteriorating finishes um, that needed a refresh. Next slide. So the scope of this project um, broken down into two, ele two elements, exterior and interior. Um, on the exterior, we replaced all the concrete in the plaza and replaced all the seating. Um, we added canopies on the east end and the west end to provide some of that um, kind of respite from the sun and added some seating at those locations as well. We replaced lighting in the existing canopy. So there are canopies on the north end, um, north of the building and on the south end of the building. We refreshed the lighting in those and we reintroduced a landscape um, on the plaza itself. And then in the interior, we consolidated all the public waiting area into one space in the center of the building. And then in that space, we installed um, some wooden, uh, ce wooden ceiling slats for um, for warmth and aesthetic and actually the previous um, condition that was a really tall ceiling and it was pretty cold and kind of industrial. 
Um, we also replaced all the lighting and all the security cameras. We renovated the restrooms that were uh, that are in that that uh, interior space. Those are public restrooms. And then we also um, renovated some existing space for the bus, bus operators and then for Transit PD on another end of the building. Next slide. So um, just wanted to highlight to our Met Council underutilized business um, program. So um, this project had um, 11 subcontractors and our contractor Ebert Construction, um, they were on track to exceed the MCUB goal of 12%. So they've actually done a great job as a contractor in utilizing this program and having um, many contractors participate, subcontractors participate. A couple photos, this slide and the next slide. So this is Tricom Communications. They did all the communications for the project and then Sun Mechanical, which did all the plumbing. So one nice thing that Ebert, um, the contractor did, they actually utilized subcontractors to really take on whole scopes, um, subsets of the project. So for, for example, Sun Mechanical, which is a, obviously an MCUB contractor, did all the plumbing on the project. So um, that was great to see that utilization. Next slide, please. And then a couple other contractors, Plant Pros did all the landscaping on the exterior and then Everest did cleaning. Next slide. So I have a series of photos that show the exciting after condition of the transit center. So um, this first section is in the bus operation side. So this is an area that was repurposed um, and it's a nice small kind of area for the bus operators to use. And this is actually a pretty popular spot that gets used quite a bit by operators whenever I'm up checking the site. Next slide. And then a refresh of that break room that you saw in a previous um, photo. We added a sink, we added a bottle, a water bottle filler, extra seating. Um, and then we also um, were able to carve out a little bit of space to add a quiet room in the building. Next slide. So for the interior public spaces, um, as you can see, this is the, uh, the wood slats at the very top of the, the photo on the ceiling really lowered um, lowered that ceiling and made it kind of a warmer visual space. We added fare collections um, equipment. So we added vending machines and, and um, machines to purchase to go to cards. And then we also added validators. Um, and then if you see the space on the right of the, um, of the ticket vending machine, that kind of that wall, that blank wall space, I'll be talking about public art opportunities um, towards the end of the presentation as well. Next slide. And this is another shot of what the interior space looks like with the real-time sign and more fair collections equipment. Next slide. And then finally in the public area, these are the, the renovated public restrooms, which turned out um, really nice. And we also were able to add drinking fountain, um, which unfortunately are, I think are still covered, but eventually we'll be able to utilize those. Next slide. And then um, this is the uh, Metro Transit Police Department office area, these two photos, just giving them extra space for, for some of their work and duties. Next slide. And then finally, some photos that show the exterior space. So the photo on the left shows all the completed sidewalk um, work that was replaced, and that was um, really interesting to try to, um, to try to phase with all the buses and passengers and just want to thank all the customers for their patience as, as we did that work. Um, also, we added canopies on each end, and that's a photo on the left is, is one of those canopies. And then the photo on the right, um, we added new lighting to the existing canopies and then added new seating as well. Next slide. Uh, we refreshed all the signage on the site and then um, additional plantings and, and new bike racks at the site too. Next slide. So the, the contractor is done with the majority of their work. They have um, just a few tasks remaining and they have some punch list items to be completed, hopefully by the end of May or early June. And then um, an exciting opportunity that our uh, public arts administrator, Mark Randlin, worked out with the city of Brooklyn Center was the um, addition of artwork. So um, the city has um, hired some artists and they will be installing some murals on the exterior of the building and then um, we'll be working with our group to install um, programmable artwork on a TV screen, and that'll be installed in the interior of the building. So um, there is a unveiling, I guess, ceremony that's um, scheduled for June 26th. 
And so that'll be an exciting event to see as well. Next slide, I think that's my last slide. So thanks to um, Ebert Construction, they did a great job and to our construction manager, Joe Jansen. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Alicia. Are there questions or comments from council members? Council member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, will the unveiling be open to A, the public and B, to us that we might be able to come up and attend? I think it would be, I love the partnership and I love, you know, it, it, the overhaul is wonderful. I think that the art will go a very, very long way to adding to the atmosphere and improving the project as well. And it would be wonderful if we might be able to be in attendance. Yeah, Chair, Council Member, that's a, that's a great uh, suggestion that is um, available to the public. So I can get more information from Mark Granlund and that can be shared with, with all of you. That'd be great, thank you. And yeah, thank you, Council Member Chambliss. Oh, thank you, it's really exciting to see this uh, construction complete. Um, it's been a long time coming and I can't wait to go out there. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to make it for the unveiling and um, just really excited. It's going to kind of be just a refresher for that whole area and um, just can't say how excited I am about this. So thank you very much for everyone who put this work together and for exceeding the MCUB goals as well. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? Um, I, if there's no, no others, I just want to say it looks beautiful. I think this station is such an important piece of our transit system. Um, and I think especially with all the connections to our ABRTs and um, I just love it so much brighter and open and looks, it just looks wonderful. So very nice work to you and your team and much appreciated. And thanks for sharing it with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right, now we're on to our last business item, or last um, information item, which is our pedestrian safety overview with Heidi Schalberg here. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, just wanted to take an opportunity to update you on a quick overview of one of the projects we're working on this year in MTS planning, which is a regional pedestrian safety action plan. Next slide, please. So one of the main goals in doing this work is to help us provide some tools to our local partners throughout the region so that we can all work toward ending pedestrian deaths and serious injuries on our transportation network. Um, we're taking an approach where we're using a safe system framework that I'll talk about in a few slides um, and really using a data-driven approach. We're looking at not just where crashes have happened in the past, but what the systemic risk factors are for where they might be likely to happen going forward. And so some of the outcomes we plan from this project are a series of risk assessment maps for the region to help our local partners understand um, some of the systemic risk based for pedestrian crashes. Um, we are hoping to use that as a data-driven recommendation for a measure um, for consideration in the regional solicitation that will, of course, that recommendation will go through the regular committee process as with any changes to the regional solicitation process. We'll be making some recommendations for countermeasures that can be done by local partners to address what we're seeing as some of these key crash patterns with pedestrian crashes, as well as additional policy and program recommendations. Next slide, please. Just wanted to give some of the context very briefly for why we're doing this type of work. Um, so when we look at how many people die while they're walking or rolling, um, throughout Minnesota each year as pedestrians, over half of those tend to be in our region. And this is really different from what we tend to see with all traffic fatalities where our region tends to make up about 30% of the state numbers. But so with having a much higher share of what's what we're seeing with these deaths and serious injuries, um, we really see that our region needs to take a bigger role in helping to address pedestrian safety. So you may remember that um, both at the state and the region, we set annual targets um, as kind of shorter term goals for fatalities and serious injuries as part of our federally required safety performance measures. So these are kind of these shorter term goals that we're working on on our way to getting to zero deaths on serious injuries. But really these don't happen on their own. So it takes additional focus and action to reach these goals. Next slide, please. 
So I already mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, the overall goal, some of the principles, apologies, that we're using to guide this work um, include the safe system approach that I'll talk about briefly. Um, we do want to ensure that equity is incorporated into the work where we can. And um, also, we want to support our local partners in making roadway and environmental changes that both encourage and support walking with safe and convenient crossings. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the safe system framework and approach, and this is really an approach that the Federal Highway Administration, who did the graphic on the slide, um, is really starting to promote more nationwide and has had some other work done um, internationally. It's similar to, if you may have heard of Vision Zero that Minneapolis is using. It's similar in some ways to that approach, um, where a starting viewpoint is that deaths and serious injuries on our road systems are not acceptable. Um, it's a little bit different from kind of what's a traditional traffic safety approach, and it's kind of acknowledging that people make mistakes. Um, and so we need to be able to create systems so that a mistake does not result in death or serious injury. And so it's kind of a layered approach and infrastructure is really a key part of that because of its the role that it can play in influencing behavior and speed. Next slide, please. So the project timeline, we kicked off the project working with tool design and Kaskaskia engineering in last fall in September. Um, really one of their first tests was to do kind of a state of the practice review we're also, of course, working with the technical advisory group on this project made up of our local and state and federal partners as well. And so one of the key initial tasks was an, a retrospective crash data analysis or where crashes have happened. And I'll be touching on a few highlights from that initial analysis. Um, and we're currently in process of reviewing the draft systemic crash data analysis and network screen that's actually going to our technical advisory group this week. This summer, then we'll be working on the recommendation for the draft measure for consideration and the regional solicitation that we plan to bring through, start, through our committee starting in July. And then this fall, we'll be focusing more on developing those countermeasure and additional policy and programmatic recommendations. We would expect the final report to be completed in first quarter of next year. Next slide, please. So I just have, I think, four slides after this as far as highlighting some of the key findings from what we found. So this is from the historic crash data analysis for where crashes have happened in the past. So we're using four years of crash data for this, 2016 to 2019. Next slide, please. First, I think um, kind of unsurprisingly, when we just look at the numbers, Hennepin and Ramsey counties have the highest numbers of both all pedestrian crashes and then all severe crashes. So when we refer to severe crashes, this combines those that are fatalities and serious injuries are generally com com combined together and referred to as severe crashes. So that was not so surprising. However, when we look at the other counties, and we are including um, the full MPO planning area for this, so it's the seven county region, plus the urbanized portions of Wright and Sherburn counties, we are seeing that the crash severity is higher in some of those counties. So they may not have as many crashes, but when they're happening, they're tending to be more severe. Next slide, please. So one of the aspects we looked at in this initial analysis was combining the data with transit stop locations. Um, so this is used as kind of a proxy for where pedestrians might be expected to be walking because we don't currently have, um, you know, unlike we have with vehicles where we have um, traffic counts for vehicles on a broad basis, we don't yet have that data developed broadly throughout the region for pedestrians walking. Um, so this was kind of a proxy for where we might expect to see people. And just as a comparison, kind of intersections that have transit nearby within 500 feet are fewer than a quarter of all intersections in the region. Yet when we looked at where these crashes were happening, 80% of the severe ones at intersections were happening near transit stops. So that was, that was something that was really um, surprising to our consultant team um, and highlighted and then as well as about half of the mid-block crashes are occurring near transit. And I want to make a really important point here. This is not saying that transit is causing these crashes. That is not what we're trying to say. This is correlation, not causation. Um, 
I think we were using this as kind of a proxy for where people may be more likely to be walking. Um, and that could be something that might result in, for example, recommendations to focus on improvements around these areas. Next slide, please. Functional classification of roadways was another um, aspect we used in the analysis that was kind of a proxy for some risk attributes that we're looking at more separately in the systemic analysis that's currently underway. And we found that 64% of the severe pedestrian crashes are happening on our mi minor arterial roadways, which are only about 14% of the road network. Um, so local roads, um, kind of more your neighborhood roads, um, are a significant part of the network, 74%. Um, but only 11% of the severe crashes are, are happening on these streets. So again, we are kind of breaking out some of these specific risk elements, such as vehicle speeds and vehicle volumes in the systemic analysis that's currently underway. Next slide. So with crash data and crash reports, we do not get race and ethnicity or income data for the individuals involved in crashes for, for all crashes. However, with fatalities, there's an additional layer of data collection at the federal level because they have a federal database that focuses on traffic fatalities. So they're able to collect additional data such as death certificates that does include race and ethnicity data. So we were able to go back for this four year period and look at only fatalities um, to look at the actual individual characteristics and found two percentages that were really kind of striking and the disparities. So the first one was 16.5% of those um, who died as pedestrians in that four year period were black or African American. And that's compared to that population making up 9.6 other regions population. The actual crash numbers are a lot smaller for those that involved those who were identified as Native American. But again, kind of the disproportionality was striking and that in that four year period, 3.7% 3, 3 of pedestrian deaths were Native Americans. But in total, that population group makes up less than half a percent of the region's population. So those were for fatalities only. When we need to look at all crashes, since we don't have that data for all crashes, the typical approach to doing that analysis is looking at the demographics for where crashes are happening. And so we did that analysis for all of the crash types using census tract data um, and American Community Survey data and found similar trends where the census tracts that had higher percentages of Black or Native American residents um, also had more pedestrian crashes and more severe crashes. And then conversely, tracts with higher shares of white residents tended to have fewer pedestrian crashes. So again, it's a little bit similar with the transit stops issue. This is not. Um, linked to, to cause, um, maybe linked to exposure. We don't know since we don't have that data right now. Um, but we did also look in this analysis specifically at the areas in Minneapolis and St. Paul that were redlined or had had kind of the racially biased lending practices in the past um, and did find similar results in that where the redlined areas in Minneapolis and St. Paul had significantly higher um, severe pedestrian crashes per square mile. And so this may be um, something that's mirrored to that if we had a database of historic transportation investments, for example, um, that would help us further look at this. But it was an important trend that we wanted to call out. Next slide. So as I mentioned, um, the work that we're currently underway and discussing with our technical advisory group this week is systemic analysis. So this is a more proactive approach than just simply looking at where crashes have happened in the past. And it's going further and looking at what are those risk factors that are associated with those crashes and where are those risk factors in combination across our road network so that we can identify more proactively areas that might need to have additional treatment to help improve safety. And so part of the goals in producing these maps and this analysis is to provide this information to our local communities to help them to kind of better understand local pedestrian safety issues. Um, it could, you know, form the basis for a recommendation for helping to prioritize projects in the regional solicitation or other funding. Um, and it's just supportive information for other safety recommendations and initiatives. Next slide, please. 
And the next steps is just reiterates some of the, the key steps that I had mentioned earlier on the project timeline, um, where we're currently doing the systemic analysis and working to draft recommendations for the regional solicitation. And then this fall, we'll continue with the countermeasure recommendation and other policy and programmatic recommendations. Next slide, please. With that, I would be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the opportunity to share this information about the project today. Thanks, Heidi. Are there questions from council members? Council member Chambliss. Yes, um, thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. Um, I like the fact that um, you're just kind of building on the information from the past and, and getting more information. So that, that'll be great to see uh, more uh, detail about uh, areas within the region and the specific uh, networks. Uh, I'd also be interested in seeing, uh, once we see that network data, um, what the disaggregated demographics look like. I know in Brooklyn Park, we had uh, several deaths uh, by Black immigrants um, on the roadways, either 252 or um, you know, uh, somewhere in the area. So um, that would be really useful to see as well and might help with training or support. Thank you, and Madam Chair and, and Member Chambliss, thank you for that comment. And that is something that we will look to, to provide once we have the network maps kind of vetted and, and reviewed. Okay, any other questions or comments? I, I just have a quick comment, Heidi. I really like how you've broken out the data like by the crash severity and all of that. I think that's really enlightening and I think it's really helpful to quantify everything that way. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense because there there are a lot of, of um, um, uh, pedestrian incidents that maybe go under the radar because they're less serious. And so I think it's important to put this information out there that way. I think it's really helpful. Yeah, that's member Tamlis. Yeah, I forgot one question and that was um, broken down by age. Um, is that gonna be coming or um, youth versus adult? Thank you, um, Madam Chair and Member Chambliss. Yes, we did look at that in the initial, um, in the initial historic analysis. There were not any um, really striking findings from that, but we do have information from that that will be included in the full report, where we really provide a lot more of the detail of the different aspects we looked at. All right. Any additional questions, comments? All right. Thank you, Heidi. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So that concludes all of our work for this evening. So unless if there's anything from council members, pause briefly. Uh, we can be adjourned and you can go enjoy a little more time of this lovely evening out there. All right. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.